So once again, welcome just for the camera and beginning again. Welcome to the No Go Life, uh, No Go For Maga Hood of Chat series, our uh, fifth edition. Woo, we kept it going. Um, every Friday, we've had to change the time from um, 12 to 6 p.m. just to recognize and help everyone else who is going back to work um to, to join this regardless so that's why we moved it to 6 p.m gmt plus one um so of course the hood of chat series is um, a series of conversations with subject matter experts to discuss the cyber risk um that are prevailing these times and of course help equip people with this the knowledge they require to be able to stay protected and stay cyber safe that's what we're on about. And this is proudly hosted by No Go For Maga. It's a not-for-profit campaign that is driving awareness about digital safety. Uh, we are doing this through you know, very, 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 very uh, exciting content like this one and just sharing knowledge across from different um, um, classes, social classes. So from you who can access it by computer, the woman who is in the market who doesn't have a, a smartphone, we are able to reach them with some relatable and very easy to understand cybersecurity knowledge to keep them safe as they, ex as they access, um, as they have digital access. So um, this is just that kind of event. And we have Dr. Joseph Ikalia, who I will bring on very, very, very soon um, to discuss this topic of um, um, email security. Um, I don't know what it is where you are um, or what your organization, how it is in your organization, um, but we definitely know that email security or email generally is a huge thing. And in times of COVID-19, we've seen a spike. And of course, our subject matter experts is going to tell us more about this, um, about how we can stay protected in these times, especially. Um, so while I want to leave issues to him, I'm just going to give you a brief um, about what this is about. So now, the, uh, um, you know, one of such, you know, ways that cyber criminals can have access to us is through the use of email for communications. Um, of course, because stress and fear of the pandemic has increased cyber criminal activities, and they know that they can reach, you know, people and businesses and homes via email that doing this in, in so aggressively. And now this is evidenced by such reports as Google's claim that it was blocking 100 million phishing emails per day with a fifth being scam emails related to coronavirus. So it's a thing really, and data is showing for it. So this fifth episode in the series seeks to explore the ways malicious actors are taking advantage of the coronavirus pandemic to launch phishing email attacks. And in this webinar, we will provide clarity on phishing attacks by explaining what phishing is. We are going to show examples of phishing emails targeted as um, targeted um, phishing emails, for example, and non-targeted uh, phishing emails I want to also touch on uh, and highlight the principles of persuasion used in phishing emails by showing several emails that employ these methods. We're also going to be exploring, of course, and explaining the technical countermeasures because the last thing we want is for you to come off uh, this webinar and feel helpless. So you definitely have a way around this and you have the upper hand with the knowledge you're going to acquire. We're also going to explain technical countermeasures like critical thinking, hovering over links, and of course, UR, UR, uh, which is web address deciphering. Thank you so much um, for coming on, and I'm sure you're going to gain a lot from this. So I'm just going to uh, welcome our, our, our guest speaker, Dr. Joseph Kaya. Joseph spent um, 18 hours each day securing um, and looking for vulnerabilities in the, in IT grade, sorry, inf enterprise grade infrastructure. So he's, he's protecting big organizations at his workplace and he has a lot of insight to share. So I'm just going to get Joseph on here. I'm not sure that I will be able to speak once Joseph comes on. So, um, so let's just have Joseph. Joseph, you have the floor. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. I, I was worried you couldn't hear me. <clears throat> Good evening. It's okay. a wonderful um, opportunity to be here. Thank you for inviting me to this um, interesting topic. And I'm going to share my screen with you so that we can go straight to business. 
I'm aware you guys gave me about 20 minutes, right? Yes, about 20 minutes for your presentation. So you can have a lot of, no, I think it's 30 minutes. Um, 20 let me see, minutes. let me review that. Yeah, I think it's about 20 or 25 minutes. I'm just going to review that. Uh, Okay, great. So it's 20 minutes, actually, correct. 20 minutes, um, 10 minutes for your presentation and 10 minutes to show and tell. And then we can take a lot of questions from me and from the audience. Okay, perfect. So let's get into it. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Now I'm sharing the full screen. Can you see the presentation slides well? Um, um, I can see two files and two folders. Okay, let me share only the presentation. Um, one second. Okay, can you see the presentation screen now? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. So guys, we're going to be talking about a very interesting um, topic and it's been making rounds on, on, in the world, on social media, on research articles, me, uh, broadcasts about fishing with COVID-19 in context. Now, before now, a lot of people have been using different societal events to take advantage of people's vulnerability in order to harvest their personal information. There are many events, including previous events here in the UK, like Brexit, that cyber criminals will use to harvest people's data, sending them malicious emails. So now we are exp experiencing a recurrence of events, but now it's about COVID-19 or coronavirus. So this presentation is going to be structured in this format. Please let me know if you hear me. Hello. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to structure this presentation in this format. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about the art of fishing. We're going to look at the brief concept about fishing, little definitions here and there. Then we're going to look at the examples of phishing emails in respect to the coronavirus phishing emails. And while we're looking at this, this, these examples, we're going to look at the the psychological um, aspects that are being taken advantage of, the theories of persuasions that cyber criminals are using in these phishing emails context. Then we're gonna spend a lot of time looking at the technical measures. It's my favorite section of this presentation on how we can build our skills, our technical skills to detect phishing emails. And then we're going to look briefly at the non-technical measures. So quickly, what is the art of phishing? Now, uh, scholars have defined it as a fraudulent attempt to obtain sensitive information or confidential information that you would not otherwise want to share with anybody. And they can use diverse means to obtain this information. In the olden days, people used to create fake websites they could create a website like the bbc.co.uk and instead of the BBC, they would type the BBQ uh, or the BBA or something like that. But it's going to look like the, the feel, the aesthetics of the website will look exactly like the BBC. And then you have to put your details there. Then that's how they get your information. But now criminals have become more advanced. They don't really have much resources to create you know, website, hosted domain. They could send you a malware. They could send you a Trojan to harvest that data instead and send it anywhere they want. So there are two forms of phishing. We have the generalistic one that they blast to everybody. It's like uh, throwing a fishing net, you know, trying to catch a fish. And then the other one is the spear phishing one. So the spear phishing one is very targeted, it's the most dangerous one. So in this case, the cyber criminal is going to do a lot of research. In cybersecurity terminology, we call it reconnaissance. They're going to try to get a lot of information about you, 
You know, a lot of people share their feelings on social media, their interests, their viewpoints, whatever is um, custom to the user, to the target victim. It's what the cyber criminal is going to use to craft his email intelligently. And then he sends it. It could spoof your friend to send this email. It could spoof the World Health Organization to send you this email. It could spoof, spoof the government. It's so easy to pretend to be something else so that you can, you know, there'll be more likelihood of you clicking or falling to these uh, phishing attacks. And then you open the malware. The victim opens the malware without thinking, without reflecting, and then the system becomes a bot. Your whole device becomes a robot. It does everything the cyber attacker wants or the malware was designed to accomplish. And in this case, the virus or the malware could be designed to send emails again. You could send emails on your behalf to other people in your contacts. You could send, you could, the virus could be designed to look for any file that is password, that has the name password. It could be designed to take information like banking details as well from your emails. And that is exactly how it works. So let's quickly look at examples, excuse me, with regards to uh, COVID-19, coronavirus. Now, these are some of the examples I found online. Um, this one is from, it appears to be from the UK government. And the email reads, um, as a precaution measure against COVID-19 in cooperation with the National Insurance and National Health Services, the government established new tax reform program for dealing with coronavirus outbreak in its action plan. And it says you are eligible for a tax refund of 128 pounds. So assess your funds now. Now, normal people without thinking, oh man, 128 pounds. And this is from an authority. So in this case, the persuasion principle used by the cyber criminal is authority. And also because it has the, um, the government, government logo, the UK government logo, is something that is quite similar to the average uh, victim. So I'm in the United Kingdom, I trust the government and I like the government. So definitely I see the government as an authority. So I believe this email. So the natural person is going to click this and then falls victim. Then we have another one here is also using the principle of authority and liking and similarity. So it com it's coming from an authoritative source that appears to be the World Health Organization. And it's generic. It's saying, dear sir, go through the attached document on safety measures regarding the spread of coronavirus and click on the button to download. So uh, I don't need to click on this button to download safety measures. I could go online to do my search myself. You know, so a lot of people may download this because it appears to be from the World Health Organization and has an impressive logo there. Then the third example we're gonna look at is uh, the persuasion of commitment and consistency. So in your organization you work with, there could be a policy regarding COVID-19 and maybe management have already given you information about, you know, information awareness, expert emails regarding things like this. So because you have been pre-informed and you've already made a commitment towards the, the anti-COVID-19 policy, you are likely to click this email so that you can read the latest updates because it's sent from your organization or sent from the admin of your organization. So these are some of the principles and some of the phishing emails we have. Now let's go to the interesting part, which is the technical countermeasures. Now, a lot of people believe that if they have antivirus on their machine, excuse me, if they have antivirus on their machine, it doesn't matter what they download on their system. It is a very wrong perception. So antivirus will only catch the easiest malware. You know, it's going to catch the easiest virus. It's, it does not do any deep packet analysis or deep analysis of the malware. 
is going to, if an antivirus works like a bodyguard, for example, a bouncer in a nightclub, maybe the instruction to the bouncer is do not take people that are under the age of 18 and check their ID cards, you know, by checking their ID card. So if they're under the age of 18, through their ID card, don't let them in. So what if I go and craft my ID card? Let's say I'm 16 years old. I craft an ID card that says I'm 18. There is no way for the bodyguard to verify my re-age other than the, my signature, which is my ID card. It's well-crafted, it's faked. So that's exactly how antivirus works, you know. So because of that, there are a plethora of tools, you know, a lot of tools, a cascade of tools that you can use to protect yourself. And these tools are free. And these are some of the tools I use in my daily work. And it's easy to use them. So let's say I receive um, an email. Now this email is using the persuasion uh, factor of social, um, social interaction. You know, so because this person is my friend on Facebook, somebody sent me this email. Now, before I go forward, I want to clarify, there is difference between spam and phishing. So spamming is not necessarily harmful. It could be an unwanted email, an unsolicited email for marketing a certain product or selling a certain product just for profit or just raising awareness about something. But phishing is very, very malicious. It has malicious intentions. So it could, for example, we're going to see how this uh, email sent by my friend, but it's not really my friend. The, the malicious actor was able to check my friends on social media and, and use their names to send me uh, fake emails, phishing emails. Now it says I should click this link. That's what it implies. There's a link here for me to click. So how do I know using virus total that this is a um, malicious link. So what I do is right click, I don't click on it, copy the link address, then I go to virus total. One second, okay. And I go to virus total, I go to URL and paste the link there. Click enter, then I search. So what do, what do I find? I found that out of about, we have over 45 antivirus engines in VirusTotal. VirusTotal is free, ex, ex, uh, extremely free. There's no cost involved. And out of these 45 antivirus, only two antivirus told me some very vital information about it. The first one is from Komodo. It tells me that this is a phishing link. And the second one tells me, which is spam, spam horse, yeah? Tells me that this is a spam. So with this already, I know that it's something dodgy. Let's look for another email as well. So this one is from an organization called Afrique.org. You know, it's, it's a phishing email, but we're gonna find out. So what I do is copy the link. It says, choose your package. Somebody is pretending to be this legitimate organization. And then the choose your package link is totally different. It's called transplantationhair.com. You know, it's funny. And then you copy it and you check on virus total. Okay. Varsoto told me everything is fine. It looks fine. So the reason why we have multiple technical countermeasures is because we can't just rely on one source of truth when we're investigating uh, phishing emails or phishing links in emails. So the next thing I want to do, I want to investigate the sender's IP. Now, every email comes with IP addresses. For example, this email, let's go back to the, the other one that comes from, yeah, this organization. 
So this email has an IP address. How do I find the IP address, the sender's IP? I go to my uh, button here that says more, then I click original, show original email. Okay, then I do control F to f and search for the word IP. Okay, so I'm gonna see every link, every key, every tag of IP. So this is the first thing I want to look at. By the way, I have about 200 emails. So <laughs> this is just one of them. <laughs> okay, so this is the first thing I'm going to look at. This is the server, the email server that sent me the email. So I want to look at more information about this server. So what I do is go to my centralops.net. Central Labs is a free uh, domain checker. You could check domain networks, service provider, ISPs associated with any IP address, and it's completely free. So I'm going to do a lot of search now on this IP to see exactly who is this, what's, what's the service, who is the ISP of this email server. I see this is in Germany. Okay. So the ISP of this person is in Germany. I go back to the email again. I want to find out the email of the person. So the person's broadband, this is the person's broadband here. So there are two emails, first of all, the email server, and then this person's broadband, the home router or whatever, uh, a person device IP of the person. The person could be using a VPN. So this could also be the VPN. And then search exactly where the person is, find the person's location. So with all this um, investigation, I'm going to be using this to build um, a good judgment. The reason why we're doing all this is to build intelligent decisions on exactly what, whether we should click these emails or not, on why we should click or why we shouldn't click it. I think I missed this one. No, this is another one. Uh, yeah, this is what I'm looking for. Okay, paste, then search. Okay, there's no much information I can find about this um, this IP. Maybe it's a, okay, it's loading already. Okay, that's fantastic. So now I know this person is in India. Wow. So why is a freak sending me an email from India? And I know the organization is not in India. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so now, yeah, so now I could uh, make a smart decision. Okay, this is another one. So you see, you, you get the idea. This is how you investigate using some technical tools. You could also check the reputation of the IP. So you wanna check the reputation of the server IP. So if we go back again, some IPs have been blacklisted and are known for this is another malicious one, and I'm known for um, sending spam. So I could use this tool called um, siren.com. Yeah, siren.com, where are you? Then search for the IP reputation. Check this IP address. So it says this, the risk level of this IP is medium, but this IP address is frequently used for sending spam. So I'm not gonna take this person serious. I'm already making a sound decision. The final step is to use a sandbox to load this attachment. Now, what is a sandbox? The sandbox is a container. It's a special container that you can use to execute files that can sit in your computer, isolated from memory, isolated from your system memory. So it uses a very small piece of your system 
that is isolated from wherever you've installed Microsoft Office, PowerPoint, every normal program running your system. So it doesn't interfere with your program. So what I want to do now is use Sandbox C to, to, to simulate the process of downloading, you know, an email, an email uh, attachment, for example. So what I do is bring my Sandbox C application. I've installed Sandbox C on my system, by the way. Run the web, web browser. Can you guys see it now? Are you seeing it? So it has this yellow, hello? Yes, we can see your web browser. Can you see this yellow box here? Yes. Perfect. So I received an email recently in one of my 200 emails. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll, later I'll tell you why, you could ask me why I have 200 emails. Um, okay, I'll ask, I'll make it, to do that. It says life-changing book, wow. So this book is gonna change wow. my life. Uh, says, Dear Dr. Ekalia, <laughs> this, this <laughs> book will change your life. So download it before it's too late. So good, I can download because let's say I've done a lot of investigation and I've not really seen much that will raise suspicion. So let me download it safely. So I could download it in Sandbox C. Now, this is new volume is going to my Sandbox, save. Good, so now I have, I can read this attachment on my Sandbox. Now, what do I really want to do? I want to see the process that is running this Sandbox. Okay, that's the most important thing to check the process because everything you download online has a service or a process. So Microsoft application has a process. PDF, which is Adobe, Adobe's application has a process. I wanna see if this process is legit. So what I would do is go to the location of my sandbox. I'm gonna bring the location quickly so you can see how we check. If you have sorry, questions, Joseph, I'm just going to, I'm sorry, Joseph. I just wanted to add the question to add. Please feel free to use the QA button at the bottom yeah. of your screen and um, just question the um, questions and answer them very well. Um, he's not showing you something that I think we're also going to be talking about. He has an amazing book, he's launching very soon. So just stay here, stay on this webinar, do not leave us, uh, and get a lot of the amazing knowledge that is given for free that you should actually pay a lot of money for. So thank you once again, Joseph, for ahead. No problem. So I want to see my process. One second. Oh, I'm going to do it again. One second. I'm going to create a unique folder for this. Forgot to do that, uh, say, good files. So I'm gonna download it again. Okay, good. So this is the good files folder where I downloaded uh, the attachments. So I'm going to run Sandbox. Yeah. Okay, so this is what I was looking for. Now I have the 
the process. Can you see this, guys? This is interesting. So instead of seeing, using my Windows process, you know, some of us are aware about the command line uh, process. Now I, am, I have a container where this file or this program is running. And we could see the name of the process here. It says acro rod 32exe So this is the process that is supporting this application here. Now, what, I, what do I need to do with this? I need to type this in Google to check if this process is legit, okay? Get more information about this process. It's acro rod 32 okay? Acro rod 32 So what is this? You know, thank God for Google University. It says this is an executable file required to run Adobe Acrobat Reader in a computer. It is an important component needed to view documents, okay? So this is cool. This is not really bad, you know. So I could read more about this process. You know, it's, it's a legitimate process. So it's not a malware. Sometimes hackers could try to, you know, use the same name to run a malicious process, but somehow, like I said, that's the low hanging fruit. You could, is the easiest catch for antivirus. Antivirus could correlate the name of the process to the, the we call it the demon of the process, daemon. <laughs> you could check that out, you know. So it could correlate the, the real call, um, the, the call uh, application code with the name and then just flag it, that's easy, you know. So because of that, they normally create their own malicious process and they don't bother changing the name. So that's there, that's that. So we could use Sandboxy to do that as well. Um, then finally, let's look at the non-technical countermeasures. So if you get a malicious email, let's go back to one of those malicious emails that says the government is giving 128 pounds. That's a lot of money in the UK, it can feed you for a week. <laughs> So the government is giving 128 pounds. So all I need to do is just type Google. It's UK government COVID-19, 128 pounds. And I put scam at the front. I always do that, scam. Okay, this is scam and it's not from the government, you see, <laughs> you see? So there are many links that will tell you about uh, if it's a scam or not. So you do a Google search, um, then you call a sender. So if you're in an organization and you get an email from your colleague or the admin staff, it's easy. Just put a call through. Like, hello, I got an email. Is this from you? You know, don't use, don't fall for the persuasion principle of liking and similarity or your previous commitment to, to follow the company's policy and then click on it blindly. No, I get, I always get this kind of uh, request from members of my organization because I'm the threat management lead. Before they click link, especially towards the end of the month when it's time for payroll and invoicing and all that, they normally get a lot of phishing emails. So they call me first, like, you know, should we click this? You know, look, do your investigation first. So always put the call through. That's easy countermeasure. Call your friend, you know, like this, my so-called friend here, or this email from, uh, apparently from my friend, this so-called email from my friend. I will call him, I'll say, go to you, I'll send him a text. Did you really send me something? What's this about? You know, if it appears more legitimate than this, because this one is really a lazy man's uh, uh, scamming job. So that's another non countermeasure Then also be, be aware of online requests for personal information, you know, especially when you're not preparing to receive it. You're not ready for it. You did not plan to receive any information. Be careful. Um, most of these hackers, they always come from, you know, organ uh, countries or organizations that, uh, that have very low reputation. And also they have... English issues, so they don't really take time to compose their emails very well. So there'll be a lot of grammatical errors you can look out for. 
and look for generic greetings as well. You know, a real um, legitimate message is probably going to address you by your name and not dear sir or dear sir slash madam. Uh, avoid emails that insist you act now, especially Friday evenings. You know, I, I never click my email, no matter what, on Friday, like 15 minutes to 5 or 15 minutes to 5.30 at the close of work. You know, don't take all those hasty decisions, decisions especially when it's close of work or close of the day. You know, you can treat it on Monday. Um, that reminds me, one incident happened recently. I, I think I locked myself out from my organization and then around 11 p.m. I wanted to walk. So I called my engineer. I sent him a text, a WhatsApp text. Can you please reset my password? <laughs> 11 p.m. And the guy said, he replied me, he said, let's do it tomorrow, man. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, why? I'm why just going to say to prove that you are you. Yeah, is it tomorrow, <laughs> man? Like, who does that? So I really wanted to work, so I had to wait till the next day. So it's a good culture. Okay, so I think we're done here. I hope we did good for time. Thank Sorry, you very I didn't much. Hear what you said last. I hope we did good for time. We kept to time? Yeah, we did. We did good for time. We did for time. And okay. some people cannot wait to ask their question. But please, guys, just give me... Um, a minute or two to ask mine really quickly. Okay. And we can take all your very wonderful questions. I've, I've gotten three questions, um, okay. which I'll be taking one after the other in the order in which it came. So mm -hmm. um, really quickly, how can a user practice good security um, when on a mobile device and can't hover over a link? So you, you see how you receive um, those emails and you can put your mouse over to sort of um, see if this is a phishing link or not yeah. before you start your investigation. Yeah. So how can people do that on mobile? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, it's a good question. So I believe you could. There's a way you can copy your links on mobile devices. Haven't you copied links before? Let me see. Yeah, you could copy your link. Just You don't need to hover over it. Just um, press click, and hold down. Yeah, press it and hold it down. Then copy the URL. Is that okay. simple? And then you could use Virus Tool to 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 scan. Okay, the great. Link. Yeah. The next question I have is: How can oversharing information make you more susceptible to phishing? And how can a user improve their proficiency at spotting phishing mails? Um, I think you sort of touched on number three. This yeah. number three question I just asked. So number two, you can go ahead and answer number two. Number two, come again with number two, please repeat. How can oversharing information make you more susceptible to phishing? Yes. Um, like I, uh, I'm going to go back to why I have 200 emails. <laughs> so it's very difficult. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to fish somebody like me because I've created mm -hmm. multiple identities, right, online. There are, there are times my name is Nick Rollins. There are times my name is Marek mm -hmm. Johnson. Maybe I want to register mm -hmm. for a free package online or something like that. So if mm -hmm. you fish that email that has that's not, that is non-attributed mm -hmm. to me, my real identity, my legal name, you're wasting your mm -hmm. time as a hacker. So mm -hmm. I, I don't really believe there is privacy. I, I believe you can share as mm -hmm. much as you want to share, but... Be careful mm -hmm. on how you attribute things to your real um, personal information. I will never use my organization's email, for example, to register on mm -hmm. Facebook, mm -hmm. to register on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Okay? I'm not going to use my mm -hmm. real name to register for a random um, software I'm going to test. You know? So, yeah, so... You could use an, uh, pseudonames. You could use uh, uh, anonymity, mm -hmm. the principle of anonymity to hide your real legal uh, information. So when they are phishing you based on your sharing, your registration on different websites and all that, mm -hmm. it's not going mm -hmm. to come directly to you. Right? It goes sure. into another different email that's not important. That's not where your ba online banking information goes to. That's not where your, your, exactly. your pay slip goes to. Yeah. 
Exactly. That's excellent. My last question is, what should a user do if he or she clicks a phishing link? Ooh. First thing you do is switch off your system, disconnect. You, you see how the world is doing social distancing, right? We're disconnecting yes. from the world. Yes. So pull the plugs from the network. Yes. Turn off your mm. router. Uh, go to your uh, phone and disconnect your, your Wi-Fi. Make sure you're not connected. So that in case mm -hmm. it's um, a Trojan, a malware mm -hmm. that is designed to send mm -hmm. data back, communicate, communicate back to the malicious person, it's not going to be able to receive mm -hmm. it. Do you understand? So it okay. can't receive that information. Yeah. So then oh, awesome. I could, yeah, I could use another device to connect to the mm -hmm. internet, right? Why that device mm -hmm. is switched off? I know most people recently, these days, we have about two computing devices. Maybe one person has a laptop, you have a phone. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so mm -hmm. use the second device to connect to the internet. So this is the device mm -hmm. that is not you did not click any link on. There is no malicious process running mm -hmm. on this device. So connect to the internet and change mm -hmm. your password in the compromised, apparent, com apparently compromised device. So change your password, mm -hmm. change your credentials and do all that. So when you change it, then you can now switch back on and delete all this information. So it's another scope entirely on doing digital forensics on your device. That can be another topic. Yeah. But the first thing is disconnect. Oh, that's, that's excellent. Um, so let's go into the questions from the attendees. There are very interesting questions here. Yeah. Prince Sunday is asking, how are we going to get the slide? After? Sorry, please, are we going to get the slides afterwards? So that's up to you. No uh, Dr. Ikaya, would you let us have your slides? Ah, no problem. <laughs> okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Okay. There's another question here from, from someone else who is anonymous. It says here, how can we send encrypted emails over the web? Fantastic. Um, it depends on the kind of encryption you're talking about. So currently, Google tells me that this is encrypted, right? This is what we call mm -hmm. encryption in motion, when the data is moving from one place to the other. There's a TLS transport layer uh, security certificate by Google, right? Mm -hmm. If I look at it, the certificate is valid, mm -hmm. it's issued by Google. So that's fine. But the second, maybe what I'm guessing now is um, he's talking about encryption at rest, right? Mm -hmm. So when I think it's actually in transit. Yeah, so it's already encrypted in transit because there's a certificate already. Yeah, by your mm -hmm. by the email server. So if you're having an email server, make sure you purchase a TLS certificate from a an authorized certificate authority, uh, authorized by by means of Komodo, for example, Komodo, GoDaddy. These mm -hmm. are well recognized um, certificate authority. But if you're talking about encryption at mm -hmm. rest, so you have your email mm -hmm. sitting down on your computer. So there's, or you want to send an email to somebody that even when an ha a hacker gets the email, so somebody hacks into the person's mm -hmm. email, the email has traveled mm -hmm. successfully, and you don't want the hacker to be able to get that email. There are different tools you can mm -hmm. use to uh, encrypt mm -hmm. your emails. Uh, one of them is um, email, let me check. There's one I use. So even if you hack me, you will need a decryption key, email encryption uh, to, so there's this Barracuda, email encryption is one of them. Mm -hmm. Some of them are very, some of them are free, but please do your due diligence <laughs> on any uh, provider you're going to use to encrypt your emails at rest. Okay. Do a due diligence first. Mm -hmm. So hope that answers the question. Yeah, that does. We have another interesting question by Kayo Detimi. Mm -hmm. He's asking, um, can Sandboxy be installed on mobile phones for mobile users to be able to investigate emails? Let me check because I've not, I've not had the cost to do it. Sandboxy is a very good, mm -hmm. I used to use them about four years ago when I discovered them. Then later, recently they were bought over by Sophos. Uh, let's go to Sandboxy. Yeah. Sophos acquired them. Uh, 
if I go to home or download, I don't think they have, uh, let's see buy. I don't think they have a mobile version, but let me quickly check Sandboxy. So this is the one I know. There could be other uh, Sandbox um, tools you could use. I don't know, they don't have a mobile version, just, um, just for your desktop. Yeah. And this is why you should be very cautious when you interact with your email via your phone. Yeah, I, I don't really think you should do serious um, um, email processing on your mobile phone. I, I don't recommend that, except you want to, you know, check blogs, uh, email your friend. You know, if you want to really settle down and download files, deal with company information, you know, avoid using your phones, you know, because most times your phone is going to tell the hacker the kind of device you're using even the version, someone would tell the version of your mm -hmm. of your phone, you know, you're giving out mm -hmm. too much, you know, to the hacker. Mm -hmm. So I don't mm -hmm. advise using your phones mm -hmm. to execute PDFs and download stuff, you know, use that for less awesome. risk. Yeah. Okay. Kamal is asking, please, what can you say about um, SPF? The Kim, the max security features of email, and can we rely on Microsoft controls without email get gateway to get to post? Um, to be honest, those things are overrated. A lot of companies, especially uh, DMAC, SPF definitely is good. You know, like for example, let's look at one malicious email quickly, and I will tell you. Mm -hmm that this email has SPF, DKIM, and DMARC record. So that will not tell you anything. You still receive. So SPF, mm -hmm. pass, right? <laughs> DKIM, mm -hmm. pass. DMARC, pass. So this guy has everything, right? Mm -hmm. it's to, to the average user, he's legitimate. He has all his records in his uh, MX. Uh, in his MX records are fantastic. MX records. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really, put, it doesn't tell you anything. I could create an a legitimate server. I could, you know, deploy exchange, right? And put mm -hmm. my TLS certificates, everything legit. I think there's a, a, a top hacker in the world, Kevin Mitnick. He, if he wants to hack, he, he, goes, he goes as far as purchasing extended validation certificates for a software. So he will build a fake software it will register a company because before you get an extended validation certificate, you need to have a company information like certificate of incorporation and all that. He does all that, right? <laughs> so, and then he will send you the software. And because it has all these wow. validation certificates, you know, it has gone through the third party checks. You think it's legitimate. So it's not enough. All these beautiful standards to, to ensure that it's authoritative and all that. It's not enough. These records are not enough. You still need to build your technical skills, just like we see here. So. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, there's another person who has asked a question um, about the social media handles and your email address so you can advance conversations. Um, do you want to share with us your social media handles and your email address? Yes, I will. Why not? I have a website. My website is getting a lot of attention these days. And I have a social media, I have Facebook. I'm going to share them with you. Last, uh, in April, I got about 2,000 malicious attempts on my website <laughs> since I signed the keynote. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I know, yeah. right? I have Instagram. I make noise on Instagram a lot. Uh, I have LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm everywhere except TikTok. TikTok, yeah. I'm not on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> We're having this conversation yesterday. <laughs> I'm on Medium. My Medium has been quiet for a while. The last time I posted on Medium was November last year. Yeah, so I have some good articles on Medium. 
I like posting about mm-hmm. technical stuff, you know. I, I post less about business strategy, security awareness stuff. I, I did a lot of that in my PhD research. So I want to be more technical as I go along. So, yeah, so that's why I post a lot of technical stuff. And I have a YouTube as well. I post um, I post a lot of my adventures in cybersecurity. Every event I go to, I get a camera around to follow me about and posting it. I post myself doing some hacking demos, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so I'll, I'll share with you my social media handles, no problem. Very interesting stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay, our last question, of course, is a yes. Kindly, um, can I get the whole lesson as a video? Yes, for sure. Um, you're, you're going to be getting this, as you've registered, we're going to be sharing the link to, to view um, um, these videos we play after the, after this session. So, Fantastic. if there are no more questions, um, thank you so much, um, um, Dr. Joseph Ikalia. We will also be making this available on YouTube on our YouTube um, channel. So look out for that. But you're going to get the link in your inbox. And okay. if you're not trusting or clicking on that link, like you've learned, you can go on YouTube and yeah. just say, <laughs> "No, go for my guy." <laughs> or you could, yeah, or you could use the technical countermeasures. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> or you use the technical countermeasures. Mm-hmm. Amazing yeah. stuff. I like mm-hmm. how you broke this down, you know, slowly and steadily sharing with us your wealth of knowledge. Thank you yeah. so much. Uh, Dr. Ikalia, can you talk about your book? Okay. So um, I'm supposed to release my book on my birthday. So in two days' time, I'll be celebrating my birthday. Um, but there's going to be some Yay. delays. Yeah. <laughs> so it's called 42 Rules for Email Security. So it's quite different because I'm making some rules based on my eight years experience. And then I'm having case study on each rule. So this is a real life case study of an email breach or email uh, attack. Mm-hmm. And this is this rule, if applied, can circumvent this attack and make the user avoid this attack. So there's a rule, mm-hmm. there's a case study, matching case study on every rule that where the rule applies. So it's, it's very practical. So you see a rule, mm-hmm. you know, and then you see a case mm-hmm. study that match it. Yeah, so it's going to help people become more aware. You know, I think a lot of people are going to be going into the technical side of this as we go along. So hopefully the book will be out. I'm looking at two weeks time. Yeah. Two weeks time is going to be on social media. And it's going to oh, be, excellent. it's going to be very cheap. Excellent. Okay. So we're going to okay. take one last question because, okay. um, I actually thought we had finished the questions, but I've just seen Kemi's question. She's been waiting to ask. Okay. So I'm just going to really take it. I'm really sorry, guys. We'll, we'll be leaving here very soon. I really want okay. it to be one hour, one hour. Yeah. The case is where after searching the email header, you to investigate the last IP. What's yeah. your take on this? That's our question. Okay, the the oh, let's go back again. It's, so this is the original. And she, she's message. followed that up saying, sorry, she's followed that up with investigating malware. There are cases where malicious code is bound to legit to a legit app or process. How can Sandbox help? Yes. So I recently had that experience um, where. I got a legitimate email, right? You you hover over the link. It tells you it is Dropbox, right? Dropbox, everybody knows Dropbox. You know, then you go to Dropbox. Then the link in Dropbox is taking you somewhere else, (laughs) you know? So I've had that experience. So you Mm -hmm. you need to be very careful. So there are two layers to it. It could be very sophisticated that they take you to Dropbox, they take you to G Drive, they just they take you somewhere very legitimate, very nice, and then when you hover over the link there, it is telling you another address, which is not Dropbox. So you need to look at the two layers. You know, always examine. To don't say that for the fact that I've gone to Dropbox or G Drive or OneDrive for Microsoft, then it's legit. No, don't say that. You know, then check the link there again. You understand? So 
cyber, cyber criminals are very, very smart. And that's the biggest challenge. They are somehow smarter than the people protecting <laughs> the systems, you know. So they look at things from different layers. They are going to cover layers, malware is in layers. So they're not going to take you to directly to a, a malicious site. They'll take you to a legit site where you download the link to a malicious site. Okay, so just have that in mind when you are doing your investigation. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kalia. Thank yeah. you so much for your wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much for everyone who has come. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are saying um, thank you because your presentation was wonderful. We've seen a couple of them in the chat box and saying thank you for your wonderful presentation wow, wow. and being so timely. I'm going to cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> All righty, so I, I'm hoping you can have you sometime soon again. Yeah. Uh, without getting any voice. <laughs> yeah, let's let's talk about malware but next time. Let's talk about malware. Yes. You know, behavior of malware. I love yes, analyzing. Yes, we, we definitely need to. Maybe around somewhere. We we'll see a live demo do. of around somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Things like that. Oh, we should definitely jump on that. I will. I will be yeah. contacting you again. Yeah. Um. So thank you, everyone, for coming for this webinar um i want you to just go on social media go on linkedin um and just tag us when you're making your comments or yeah. go to our page on linkedin i would love uh, to see the tags, please. yeah <laughs> yes please really tag us and really share how this this was impactful for you knowledge you gained you know that's your way of telling us thank you please just go online and just speak about this and tag us so we can see and maybe we share what you're saying about this and so more people can know that these sessions hold and they're very impactful so thank you very much guys and also we follow us on social media no go for maga on instagram twitter uh, linkedin and, uh, and uh, facebook we share a lot of ongoing tips around cyber security and how you can stay safe especially in this time um thank you very much everyone and please follow dr kaya he's sharing quite a lot every day um thank you so much um dr joseph coming. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.